is inside the White House. He is about to address the nation about his border wall, the one he wants to build between the United States and Mexico. He has threatened to invoke emergency powers to get that wall built. What can we expect from the president tonight? Will he declare a state of emergency? While we're waiting for the president and we'll continue to watch uh, in the box below, you'll see. Let's go to Washington and the CBC's Ellen Morrow. Ellen, what do you expecting from Donald Trump, who is expected to speak any moment. Well, Carol, this is going to be President Trump uh, making the case for the border wall with Mexico. And you have to think about the broader context here. We're now in the 18th day of this government shutdown. That shows no signs of ending. The reason the government did shut down was over this issue of uh, funding for the border wall with Mexico, a wall that President Trump promised uh, Mexico would pay for. That's the reason we have this shutdown. And so this is the president coming out and trying to sway public opinion to his side, trying to put the blame for all of this on uh, the Democrats and say that there is a national crisis at the southern border that he is trying to deal with. So it is, you know, again, really uh, the president trying to get his message out to the uh, American yeah. people. And now the question is, is this message one that is warranted? When it came, when it was announced yesterday that he would give this primetime address, the immediate question was, does the situation on the southern border actually constitute this kind of crisis and would it be fair to allow President Trump to take to the networks? Uh, uh, Ellen, I'm going to interrupt you now. The president is on the screen. We're going to go live to the Oval Office. Let's listen in. Because there is a growing humanitarian and security crisis at our southern border. Every day, Customs and Border Patrol agents encounter thousands of illegal immigrants trying to enter our country. We are out of space to hold them, and we have no way to promptly return them back home to their country. America proudly welcomes millions of lawful immigrants who enrich our society and contribute to our nation. But all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. It strains public resources and drives down jobs and wages. Among those hardest hit, are African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Our southern border is a pipeline for vast quantities of illegal drugs, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. Every week, 300 of our citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border. More Americans will die from drugs this year than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. In the last two years, ICE officers made 266,000 arrests of aliens with criminal records, including those charged or convicted of 100,000 assaults, 30,000 sex crimes, and 4,000 violent killings. Over the years, thousands of Americans have been brutally killed by those who illegally entered our country and thousands more lives will be lost if we don't act right now. This is a humanitarian crisis, a crisis of the heart and a crisis of the soul. Last month, 20,000 migrant children were illegally brought into the United States, a dramatic increase. These children are used as human pawns by vicious coyotes and ruthless gangs. One in three women are sexually assaulted on the dangerous trek up through Mexico. Women and children are the biggest victims, by far, of our broken system. This is the tragic reality of illegal immigration on our southern border. This is the cycle of human suffering that I am determined to end. My administration has presented Congress with a detailed proposal to secure the border and stop the criminal gangs, drug smugglers, and human traffickers. It's a tremendous problem. Our proposal was developed by law enforcement professionals and border agents at the Department of Homeland Security. These are the resources they have requested to properly perform their mission and keep America safe, in fact, safer than ever before. The proposal 
from Homeland Security includes cutting-edge technology for detecting drugs, weapons, illegal contraband, and many other things. We have requested more agents, immigration judges, and bed space to process the sharp rise in unlawful migration fueled by our very strong economy. Our plan also contains an urgent request for humanitarian assistance and medical support. Furthermore, we have asked Congress to close border security loopholes so that illegal immigrant children can be safely and humanely returned back home. Finally, as part of an overall approach to border security, law enforcement professionals have requested $5.7 billion for a physical barrier. At the request of Democrats, it will be a steel barrier rather than a concrete wall. This barrier is absolutely critical to border security. It's also what our professionals at the border want and need. This is just common sense. The border wall would very quickly pay for itself. The cost of illegal drugs exceeds $500 billion a year, vastly more than the $5.7 billion we have requested from Congress. The wall will also be paid for indirectly by the great new trade deal we have made with Mexico. Senator Chuck Schumer, who you will be hearing from later tonight, has repeatedly supported a physical barrier in the past, along with many other Democrats. They changed their mind only after I was elected president. Democrats in Congress have refused to acknowledge the crisis. And they have refused to provide our brave border agents with the tools they desperately need to protect our families and our nation. The federal government remains shut down for one reason and one reason only, because Democrats will not fund border security. My administration is doing everything in our power to help those impacted by the situation. But the only solution is for Democrats to pass a spending bill that defends our borders and reopens the government. This situation could be solved in a 45-minute meeting. I have invited congressional leadership to the White House tomorrow to get this done. Hopefully, we can rise above partisan politics in order to support national security. Some have suggested a barrier is immoral then why do wealthy politicians build walls, fences, and gates around their homes? They don't build walls because they hate the people on the outside, but because they love the people on the inside. The only thing that is immoral is the politicians to do nothing and continue to allow more innocent people to be so horribly victimized. America's heart broke the day after Christmas, when a young police officer in California was savagely murdered in cold blood by an illegal alien who just came across the border, the life of an American hero was stolen by someone who had no right to be in our country. Day after day, precious lives are cut short by those who have violated our borders. In California, an Air Force veteran was raped murdered and beaten to death with a hammer by an illegal alien with a long criminal history. In Georgia, an illegal alien was recently charged with murder for killing, beheading, and dismembering his neighbor. In Maryland, MS-13 gang members who arrived in the United States as unaccompanied minors were arrested and charged last year after viciously stabbing and beating a 16-year-old girl. Over the last several years, I've met with dozens of families whose loved ones were stolen by illegal immigration. I've held the hands of the weeping mothers and embraced the grief-stricken fathers. So sad, so terrible. 
I will never forget the pain in their eyes, the tremble in their voices, and the sadness gripping their souls. How much more American blood must we shed before Congress does its job? For those who refuse to compromise in the name of border security, I would ask, imagine if it was your child, your husband, or your wife, whose life was so cruelly shattered and totally broken. To every member of Congress, pass a bill that ends this crisis. To every citizen, call Congress and tell them to finally, after all of these decades, secure our border. This is a choice between right and wrong, justice and injustice. This is about whether we fulfill our sacred duty to the American citizens we serve. When I took the oath of office, I swore to protect our country. And that is what I will always do. So help me God. Thank you and good night. All right, United States President Donald Trump making the case for a border wall between the United States and Mexico, as expected, saying there is a growing security crisis at the U.S. southern border, saying all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal immigration. He reaffirmed his uh, request that he wants $5.7 billion, but, um, and he says this is a, it's a humanitarian crisis that has to be looked after. It is a sacred duty, and he says at the request of Democrats, he agrees to a steel barrier and not a concrete barrier. Let's bring our panel in on this now. Joining me from Washington, Republican strategist Ryan Williams and Democrat strategist Craig Varoga. All right, Craig, let me start with you first. Uh, what did you make of that speech from the Oval Office? Well, I mean, there were no surprises in what he said. He continued to uh, you know, shared some false statistics. He continued to make partisan attacks. What were the false uh, statistics? I mean, you know, I mean, the the numbers, you know, that he talks about in terms of, you know, I mean, the number of crimes that are committed, the number of people who are apprehended. You know, a lot of work's been done on that. You know, over the last, you know, several years, and I mean, those numbers just are not accurate. You know, when mm. he talks about, you know, people arrested and so forth. Yeah, thousands uh, of know, Americans they're, 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 they're brutally killed by yeah. people illegally in, entering well, the country. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're made up statistics mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and when it's the, the number of, you know, I mean, you know, you know, undocumented immigrants has declined. Uh, the number of crimes that are committed, you know, is, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it, it was more of the same. You know, I think that, you know, we, um, I mean, you know, he, he clearly stuck to a script. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually thought he kind of looked like it was tranquilized, but, you know, we'll see how this thing plays out, you know, with the tweets and with the trip order, you know, over the next few days. Okay. It, it, it did feel, Ryan, what did you make of that? First, let me get your opinion. What did you make of his speech? You know, I didn't think there was any surprise in here. I didn't think there was anything really new. It was the, the, the rhetoric he used during the campaign that he's used uh, during his first two years in office. The speech was focused in the sense that he read off a script. There were no questions afterwards, as there have been in some of these press conferences that have gone wildly off script in the past. So I, I, you get to make his points. He didn't make any new points. No, was it he, worthy of prime time? I mean, I wonder if a number of television executives in the United States are scratching their heads going, what, what did we just give over time to? Well, look, when the President of the United States makes a request, I think the network executives have to, to, to do it. When it's the, the President's first time, if he were to abuse that privilege, they could make a, a call down the road. But, um, you know, this, I think it was appropriate in this instance to give him the time. But, yeah. you know, this is a speech on a major national issue. Uh, I, I didn't really hear any uh, concessions or olive branches, except maybe that the wall's going to be steel now and not concrete. Um, so, uh, <laughs> not a whole lot new, and we'll see how it plays out. I think it did give him an opportunity to kind of concentrate the message. And look, he got a lot of, a lot of uh, flack over the, the holiday break while well, he stayed in Washington and uh, everyone Ryan, left town. Ryan, he didn't stand by. We're sitting Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are about to speak. Let's listen in. about how we can end this shutdown and meet the needs of the American people. Sadly, much of what we heard from President Trump throughout this sense of shutdown has been full of misinformation and even malice. 
The president has chosen fear. We want to start with the facts. The fact is, on the very first day of this Congress, House Democrats passed Senate Republican legislation to reopen government and fund smart, effective border security solutions. But the president is rejecting these bipartisan bills, which would reopen government, over his obsession with for forcing American taxpayers to waste billions of dollars on an expensive and ineffective wall, a wall he always promised Mexico would pay for. The fact is, President Trump has chosen to hold hostage critical services for the health, safety, and well-being of the American people and withhold the paychecks of 800,000 innocent workers across the nation, many of them veterans. He promised to keep government shut down for months or years, no matter whom it hurts. That's just plain wrong. The fact is, we all agree we need to secure our borders while honoring our values. We can build the infrastructure and roads at our ports of entry. We can install new technology to scan cars and trucks for drugs coming into our nation. We can hire the personnel we need to facilitate trade and immigration at the border. We can fund more innovation to detect unauthorized crossings. The fact is, the women and children at the border are not a security threat. They are a humanitarian challenge, a challenge that President Trump's own cruel and counterproductive policies have only deepened. And the fact is, President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis, and must reopen the government. Thank you. Leader Schumer. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. My fellow Americans, we address you tonight for one reason only. The President of the United States, having failed to get Mexico to pay for his ineffective, unnecessary border wall, and unable to convince the Congress or the American people to foot the bill, has shut down the government. American democracy doesn't work that way. We don't govern by temper tantrum. No president should pound the table and demand he gets his way or else the government shuts down, hurting millions of Americans who are treated as leverage. Tonight, and throughout this debate and throughout his presidency, President Trump has appealed to fear, not facts, division, not unity. Make no mistake, Democrats and the President both want stronger border security. However, we sharply disagree with the President about the most effective way to do it. So, how do we untangle this mess? Well, there's an obvious solution. Separate the shutdown from arguments over border security. There is bipartisan legislation supported by Democrats and Republicans to reopen government while allowing debate over border security to continue. There is no excuse for hurting millions of Americans over a policy difference. Federal workers are about to miss a paycheck. Some families can't get a mortgage to buy a new home. Farmers and small businesses won't get loans they desperately need. Most presidents have used Oval Office addresses for noble purposes. This president just used the backdrop of the Oval Office to manufacture a crisis, stoke fear, and divert attention from the turmoil in his administration. My fellow Americans, there is no challenge so great that our nation cannot rise to meet it. We can reopen the government and continue to work through disagreements over policy. We can secure our border without an ineffective, expensive wall. And we can welcome legal immigrants and refugees without compromising safety and security. The symbol of America should be the Statue of Liberty, not a 30-foot wall. So our suggestion is a simple one. Mr. President, reopen the government and we can work to resolve our differences over border security but end this shutdown now. Thank you. All right, Democratic leadership, uh, the U.S. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer and the uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Let's bring back our panel on this. I'll remind you once again, Republican strategist Ryan Williams and Democrat strategist Greg Varoga. Uh, Ryan, I interrupted you, so I'm going to pick up with you again. Uh, what do you make of that, that suggestion of Chuck Schumer that separate the shutdown from the arguments over border security? Would the Trump administration go for that? 
Well, it's a suggestion they've made before, and there's some evidence that some Republicans on the Hill, moderates, are, are softening, and think that might be the best way forward. But this, the president's not budging at this point. I thought that speech was more of the same of what they've been saying as well. I thought there was nothing new in that speech either. It actually was kind of an awkward format, having them both stand there, one not talking and one talking. So I don't know if this speech is going to be very impactful. I think it's going to be kind of noise that the public will um, tune out. Uh, and I don't think really anything we've seen tonight is going to move the ball forward in this debate, because they're entering tomorrow for, uh, I think, this, this discussion at the White House in the same spot they were before, not budging on, on either side. Craig, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, I have a couple of things. First, I think that if you just look at this historically, uh, most of the times when presidents uh, speak to the nation from the Oval Office, they do it to calm people down uh, and to tell them that things are going to be okay. Uh, this is a very historic speech in the sense that it's very unique. Uh, because this president, instead of speaking to calm down the American public, he's trying to scare them. And I agree with Ryan that not much has changed. Uh, I think that you know either Ryan or I or any number of people could have written that speech, not because we agree with it, but because we know that that's what he's going to say. Uh, I think that you heard from both you know Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer uh, that Democrats want to reopen the government. They don't want to shut this down. Uh, as I said in, a, in an earlier, you know, when we first spoke, two thirds of the American public want the government to be reopened, uh, regardless of what they think about the wall. And that puts Donald Trump in a minority position uh, in the United States. Uh, it may not put him in a minority position among his supporters, uh, but I think that's those are the only people that he was talking to tonight because he wasn't speaking to the 60 percent of the American people who disapprove of him are the two thirds who want the government to be reopened. Do you think that's true, Ryan? Do you think that he was only speaking to his base? Um, look, I think he was trying to take his appeal to the whole country. He, he has not been satisfied, I think, with the coverage thus far of his um, uh, of, of the shutdown and his perspective. And look, he remained largely out of the spotlight during the time uh, over the, the holiday break. He was at the White House saying he was working, but he really didn't use the bully pulpit during that period when Nancy Pelosi was in Hawaii and others were out of town. So I think he's trying to make up for it here. He's trying to drive the message. Um, he got the opportunity to make his case to the nation. Uh, I assume his supporters will be very fired up by what they heard. It was a pretty um, strident speech, as it usually is when he discusses this issue. But he's going to have to keep this going, and he can't wake up tomorrow and start tweeting about a witch hunt and Robert Mueller, if he, you know, and other other items, if he wants to maintain the focus on his perspective. So we'll see if he can, from his perspective, keep the message going that he drove tonight and not distract it with some other issue tomorrow. Well, Chuck Schumer says the president used the Oval Office tonight to divert attention from turmoil in the administration. What do you think the point of that speech was, Craig? A Donald Trump speech? Yeah. Yeah, look, I, th I think he's trying to distract attention from the Mueller investigation uh, and from, you know, you know, everything that, you know, the various, you know, investigators are looking into regarding his company and his campaign and so forth. Uh, I also think that it's because he made a campaign promise four years ago that he knew he could not keep, and he has to blame somebody uh, for the fact that he cannot keep the promise of making Mexico pay. He knew four years ago that that was a you know, promise that he could not keep, and now he's trying to blame somebody else you know, for the fact that he can't keep it. Okay. It, it, what do you think, Ryan, uh, your response to what Craig just said, and, and what do you think the point of the speech was tonight? What was in his mind? It was it setting the table for perhaps down the road declaring a state of emergency, or is he going to give up the ghost? I think the point of the speech was to up, up the ante on this. I mean, the wall has been the central component of his campaign. He did say Mexico was going to pay for it. Now in the speech we hear that Mexico is going to indirectly pay through it through the great trade deal that he negotiated. So I think he's trying to set the parameters of this debate. He, he is feeling pressure from his base on this. We're two years in. There's now a Democratic House. so He's got less leverage in the, in the Congress to get this done. It was the key component of, of his election. And um, you know, when there was talk at the end of the year of passing a bill to fund the government through uh, February and, and not deal with border security, there was um, a lot of critics on the right saying he had failed to meet his promise, and I think he's heard that. He's trying to deliver on the promise that he made during the campaign to tackle this issue. And if he can't get it through Congress, maybe he looks at uh, the emergency declaration. But again, that will go to the courts. That will not be something that will just magically happen if he's going to try to go that, that route. 
and I don't think any of us know how that'll that'll completely end up if he goes uh, for, with the, with the emergency declaration. All right, we've chosen some clips uh, to review. Uh, let's play the first one now. This is Trump saying, at the request of the Democrats, he agrees to a steel barrier, not concrete. Take a listen. Law enforcement professionals have requested five point seven billion dollars for a physical barrier. At the request of Democrats, it will be a steel barrier rather than a concrete wall. This barrier is absolutely critical to border security. It's also what our professionals at the border want and need. This is just common sense. The Craig, what do you make of that? You know, this isn't about steel versus concrete. This is about the fact that it's a manufactured crisis and that he made a promise he cannot keep. You know, I don't know what Democrats he's referring to. They might be the same presidents that said that they wanted to build a wall when every single one of them said that they never did that. Okay. Uh, Ryan, is um, it enough of a compromise? I mean, what was he trying to no, show? No, it's, it's not going to, that's not going to move Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer. They're gonna, it's gonna, if they're going to get some sort of wall funding down, he wants to make a compromise. It would have to be something much larger, like a, a DACA a fix or, or some something more than that. Steel versus concrete is not going to win over House Democrats. They're pretty dug in on this issue. Their base on, on their side is also very opposed to any kind of wall. I do think steel slats, uh, if that's what we're calling it, is the preferred uh, design f from most law enforcement uh, uh, officials because they, can, they, they believe they can police the border better if they can see through it. But that's not, <clears throat> I don't think that's an argument that Democrats are going to pick up in the House and, and suddenly support this. If he wants to compromise, there's got to be something else. I haven't heard it yet. I don't think anybody has. So we remain at loggerheads right now. All right, let's take a listen to this. Some have suggested a barrier is immoral. Then why do wealthy politicians build walls, fences, and gates around their homes? They don't build walls because they hate the people on the outside, but because they love the people on the inside. All right. Uh, you're smiling broadly, <laughs> Ryan. I've got to go to you first on this one. I mean, it was kind of a creative way to say that there's a, a purpose for walls. Look, people in this country do want border security. There's, there's a debate over this wall. Um, uh, comparing it to the home around your fence, that's kind of a unique uh, way of doing it. But um, and I think he's trying to make the point uh, that 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 fences are are, uh, are are a way of controlling your border, whether it's your house or your country. Um, but uh, I thought it was kind of a, a funny line when I heard it in the middle of the speech. Craig, you know he's been tweeting about that for about a week or so. Uh, I mean the interesting thing is is that his daughter Ivanka lives around the corner from former President Obama, and you know Donald Trump's falsely been claiming that you know. Barack Obama has a 10-foot fence around his house. Uh, I think it's the, I think it's a nice little or interesting, you know, little, you know, rhetorical flourish, but I don't think it means anything. All right, let's take a look at the, listen to the response from the Democrats. This president just used the backdrop of the Oval Office to manufacture a crisis, stoke fear, and divert attention from the turmoil in his administration. My fellow Americans, there is no challenge so great that our nation cannot rise to meet it. We can reopen the government and continue to work through disagreements over policy. We can secure our border without an ineffective, expensive wall. And we can welcome legal immigrants and refugees without compromising safety and security. Craig, what do you what do you make of that? How is that going to go over with the public? And uh, what you know, what are the chances? Well, look, I mean, the, the public clearly agrees with what Senator Schumer and Speaker Pelosi said, that the government should be reopened. Uh, I think that that is, a, and that, that is not only true, it's not only responsible, it is a slam dunk political argument. Uh, I don't think it's going to change Donald Trump's mind, uh, and I don't think it's going to change, you know, what, you know, Mitch McConnell uh, and the leadership in the Senate do. Uh, but the American public believes that the government should be reopened, and the American public believes that it should not be shut down uh, because of a campaign promise that Donald Trump made four years ago that he cannot keep, and that he did not keep when the government was controlled in every chamber of Congress, or in both chambers of Congress, uh, and in the White House by, uh, you know, by Republicans. So it's, you know, I, I think it was a good thing for Senator Schumer to say, and clearly Americans agree with it, but I don't think the president cares about that. 
Okay, if the president doesn't care about it, Ryan, what what's the what's the inevitability when a president and the public are at loggerheads? Not the Democrats, but in opinion on this very thing for a long period of time. I mean, what's what's the end game? What happens? I don't think we know at this point. Look, people want the government open. They also do care about border security. He needs to find some way out of the box he's put himself into because the president took responsibility for this shutdown before it happened in the Oval Office with Chuck Schumer. He said, I'll take responsibility for it. That puts him in a tough spot. Uh, people don't like shutdowns, and they usually blame one side, and he set himself up for that. So um, he needs to find a way to, to get out of this by saving face, by um, getting something on border security, and then getting the government reopened. I don't quite know how he's going to do that right now. Um, because both sides aren't moving and, you know, offering a steel wall versus a concrete wall, that's not going to do it. And I'm just not sure what, what they're going to do with this meeting tomorrow to move the ball forward at all at this point. Well, strategists must be looking at this, uh, you know, Republican strategists and Republicans in, in Congress and saying this president could take us down in the next election. Um, if that happens, how are they going to move the ball? How could they possibly move the ball? Is that for me? My yeah, question? sure. Um, I don't look. The next election is so far away at this point. Shutdowns come and go. We had a shutdown. Uh, I think it was 2013 with Republicans being blamed for it, and they took big. They had big wins in 2014. So I'm not putting too much stock in how this will affect 2020. If they get this resolved in a few weeks, there'll probably be 20,000 other things between now and then that we'll focus on. So I, I don't think it has too much of an impact on 2020 if it's resolved in the next few few weeks. Craig, what do you think? You know, look, I think that, um, I mean, Republicans are between a rock and a hard place uh, because Donald Trump has taken over the Republican Party, uh, despite, you know, Republicans of conscience like, you know, despite, you know, Republicans of conscience like Mitt Romney, uh, you know, who spoke out about the president's character a week ago. But, you know, Republicans, you know, if they oppose the president, uh, they will have a very difficult time in Republican primaries next year. But if they agree with them, uh, they will be opposing what a majority what, what a majority of Americans want, which is a responsible government. I, I think what you're hearing from both Ryan and me is that nobody in the United States really knows how this is going to end. And we won't know it's over until Donald Trump tweets uh, that it's over. And then somebody rushes in with a piece of paper that, he get, that they get him to sign at that very moment to reopen the government. And when that happens, I don't know when that's going to be. All right. Well, we'll leave it on that note. Democrat strategist Craig Varoga and Republican strategist and former spokesperson for Mitt Romney, Ryan Williams. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate you being with hey. me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, we'll have more analysis of Trump's speech and the Democrats' rebuttal. Uh, we'll take some of the statistics to a specialist in immigration in the United States. You're watching CBC News Network tonight. Back in a moment.
U.S. President Donald Trump says all Americans are hurt by illegal immigration. Tonight from the Oval Office, the U.S. President tried to convince the country that there is a crisis along their southern border. But the U.S. President did not declare a national emergency. Instead, he announced another meeting with congressional leaders aimed at ending the government shutdown tomorrow, not something that normally warrants an Oval Office address. For more on Trump's address to the nation and the Democrats' response, I'm joined by the CBC's Ellen Morrow in Washington. Ellen, not a lot new in this speech tonight. No, not a lot new at all, Carol. Really, that, that news that you mentioned of President Trump uh, inviting congressional leadership to the White House for a meeting tomorrow to try to discuss a way of ending this shutdown. What's clear from hearing from President Trump and the Democratic leaders tonight is that there is absolutely no sense at this moment of how this shutdown is going to end because the two sides could not be further apart. And starting with what we heard from President Trump, he used some extremely stark language to really paint a picture of a crisis at the southern border, talking about human trafficking, about drugs coming into the country, uh, and, and again, painting it as a crisis. Now, important to point out, he talked a lot about the drugs coming in, as I just mentioned. Most of the illegal drugs in the United States come from other ports of entry. They're not coming from across uh, the southern border with Mexico. Also important to point out that during the Trump administration, Administration, we've actually seen uh, illegal immigration go down. So the president is being criticized for some of the way he's presented that case. But he also talked a lot about the wall with Mexico, and that is the reason we have this uh, government shutdown, because of the dispute over funding the wall with Mexico. And President Trump, who had previously promised a concrete wall, talked about the wall actually being a steel barrier in tonight's address. Here's a bit of what he had to say. Law enforcement professionals have requested $5.7 billion for a physical barrier. At the request of Democrats, it will be a steel barrier rather than a concrete wall. This barrier is absolutely critical to border security. It's also what our professionals at the border want and need. This is just common sense. Now, somewhat problematic in that statement, Carol, is the president saying that at the request of the Democrats, uh, this wall will now be a steel barrier. This is not uh, a request from the Democrats. And frankly, changing concrete to steel is not going to be enough to entice the Democrats to end uh, this shutdown, to uh, pass a bill that the president that would allow funding for the wall for President Trump. So what we have at the end of both of these speeches is re really no sense on how this is going to end as the shutdown grinds into uh, its 19th day starting tomorrow. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer did the official response to the president. A lot of criticism from both of them. That's right. They said the president was choosing uh, fear rather than facts, and they went on to rebut some of the claims that he made uh, in his speech. And they both repeatedly pointed out that President Trump had promised that Mexico would pay for this wall, a wall, uh, the funding of, over which is now at the center of this government shutdown. And President Trump addressed that somewhat in his speech, saying that Mexico would pay indirectly for the wall through uh, the new trade, trade deal with Mexico uh, and Canada. Um, Chuck Schumer also accused President Trump of governing by temper tantrum and holding uh, the American government hostage over this wall issue. Here's what he had to say. The symbol of America should be the Statue of Liberty, not a 30-foot wall. So our suggestion is a simple one. Mr. President, reopen the government and we can work to resolve our differences over border security, but end this shutdown now. So, Carol, to resolve this is going to require some compromise on both sides. But what's happening is that both sides are increasingly dug in, and it's difficult politically for both sides. President Trump has promised this wall time and time and time and time again. Uh, he didn't get it done during the first two years of his administration when the Republicans were in control of all of Congress. Now the Democrats control the House, so he's lost some leverage there. Uh, so this promise seems very unlikely to be 
uh, fulfilled. And the Democrats can't really give in on, on any wall funding either. So again, not clear at all how this is going to end. Uh, and it's an understatement to say that tomorrow's meeting at the White House, if it goes ahead, will be extremely interesting. Thank you. Immigration is at the center of this standoff, and the president has made a lot of misleading claims over the years to support his claim that migrants pose a threat to all Americans. And tonight, there were a lot of statistics in this speech. Joining me to talk about uh, what was in the speech, and we'll do a bit of a fact check about immigration in the United States. Sarah Pierce joins me. She is the policy analyst for the Migration Policy Institute. Sarah joins me live from Washington via Skype tonight. All right, Sarah, let's start. Let's go through uh, bits and pieces of this, um, uh, some, of the, some of the indicators or the, the, uh, the uh, numbers and assertions made by the U.S. president tonight. Uh, all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. It strains public resources and drives down jobs and wages. True or false? Well, um, false. I immigration overall, both illegal and, and regularized immigration, helps the U.S. economy. There's been many rigorous economic studies showing that, that for the most part, these are good. Of course, we overall, if immigration is illegal, that's bad. We'd rather have regularized immigration. It works better both for the receiving country and for the immigrants themselves. But overall, this is not a huge problem. This is not a drain on our economy. Our, our country is doing you know, very well, illegal migration or not. Okay. Among those hardest hit, he says, are American, African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Our southern border is a pipeline for vast quantities of illegal drugs, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. 300 citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border, and more Americans will die from drugs this year than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. So this is the president doing everything he can to paint immigration as a, a crisis. And he's doing that by borrowing from other crises, that primarily the, the drug crisis. It's true that we have a major problem with drugs in the United States and that a lot of those drugs flow across the southern border. But as your previous correspondent referenced, most of those drugs are actually coming through ports of entry, the vast majority. In fact, it was a U.S. government agency that said that in 2018. So a wall along the southern border won't actually solve that. So he's just, he's taking from a lot of crises and, and he's, mm. he's really mis making them very misleading in the idea of, of pushing people to towards a wall. Okay, officers, um, I saw immigration officers made 266,000 arrests of aliens with criminal records, including those charged or convicted of 100,000 assaults, 30,000 sex crimes, and 4,000 violent killings. Over the years, thousands of Americans have been brutally killed by those who illegally entered our country, and thousands more lives will be lost if we don't act right now. So first, to address um, the, the arrest of um, immigrants who have criminal records, one of our strategies at the southern border, and we've had this strategy for over a decade now, is to prosecute illegal border crossers, because we've found that if we prosecute them, they're less likely to come back into the country. So many of the apprehended um, illegal border crossers actually have criminal records that were that were caused by crossing the border illegally. So when you're looking at illegal immigrants, the majority of them have immigration-related criminal records. Um, so that's a little misleading. And then time and time again, um, studies have shown that Overall, immigrants, whether they're unauthorized or legal immigrants, they commit crimes at much lower rates than U.S. nationals. Uh, so the president, you know, played up these statistics, and he also detailed, you know, a bunch of very unfortunate and very gruesome uh, crimes that were committed by immigrants, uh, which unfortunately he's just, you know, aiming to to skew public perception of immigrants when reality the, the data shows that they don't commit crimes any more than, than regular people. Okay. Last month, he said 20,000 migrant children were illegally brought into the United States. A dramatic increase. Children used as human pawns by vicious coyotes and ruthless gangs. So he's right that we've had a huge increase of families and unaccompanied children arriving at the southern border. But the way he structured that in his speech, he, he gave the number of children who have arrived, which is a completely legitimate number, but he followed it by saying that many of these, that 
these children are, are, are being abused and being used by smugglers, um, when in reality it's an extremely small percentage, something less than 1% of individuals at the southern border apprehended are found to be using children um, you know, in a, in a misleading way to try to gain favor at the southern border. That's actually a very small problem compared to the very legitimate crisis we have of families and unaccompanied children arriving at the southern border. So just before I let you go, Sarah, how would you characterize what you heard tonight from the president? What I heard was a lot of his greatest hits from the 2016 presidential election. He really hammered down on the idea of, of Americans first and the idea that immigrants commit crimes and they're pouring across the southern border. I think that the president is betting that he can win public favor in this government shutdown fight the same way he won public, public favor in the 2016 election. My hope is that the U.S. public has matured since then and, and learned some about immigrants immigration and what it contributes to our country and what is actually going on at the southern border. Um, but I think time will tell whether or not that's true. Sarah Pierce, policy analyst for the Migration Policy Institute, joining me from Washington tonight. Sarah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Carol. One of the biggest stories on this side of the border, the truck driver involved in the Humboldt Broncos bus crash has pleaded guilty to 29 charges in connection to that deadly collision last spring. Why he pleaded guilty, no plea deal, and what the victim's families are saying straight ahead. This is CBC News Network Tonight.
signs of solidarity across the country with First Nations opposing a pipeline in northern BC. This is a march earlier today in Toronto, in Vancouver. The BC Supreme Court was the scene of a rally that drew hundreds of supporters of the so-called land defenders and dueling demonstrations in Calgary, with supporters on one side and on the other, those demanding the pipeline be built. The rallies come one day after RCMP officers stormed past a barricade that was blocking access to land where the pipeline is set to be built. The police were enforcing an interim court injunction, allowing construction work to continue. Fourteen people were arrested last night after talks with hereditary chiefs failed. In Ottawa, protesters managed to delay a speech Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was supposed to deliver at a forum on First Nations rights. Anti-pipeline demonstrators got into the building and staged a die-in, showing their support for the Indigenous protesters arrested yesterday in northern B.C. The CBC's Evan Dyer on what happened next. Well, we saw a number of